So hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. So it's great to have so many participants. Thank you for joining us. So we want to welcome you to today's webinar with Ocean Networks Canada. My name is Luisa Sarmiento, and I will be moderating this session today. We also have Kaylin Correa, who will help us with the interactivity and to monitor the chat. Peter Romo will be our speaker today. So before we begin, I want to introduce Ocean Networks Canada Fall Webinar Series. So as some of you may know already, the aim of this series is to offer free online interactive events featuring ocean-related topics. This series introduces both scientific and indigenous approaches to understand ocean changes and their importance nowadays. So today's webinar will be about meaningful indigenous engagement building true partnership in ocean science with our wonderful speaker, Peter Romer. So now let's see how you can participate in today's session. Thanks, Louisa. As you can see on the screen, you can participate in Mentimeter. Simply go to menti.com and enter the following code, 9935763. You can do this on your smartphone or use a different browser tab or you can download the application Mentimeter. And if that's not possible for you, just put your answers and comments in our Zoom chat. Great, so now let's see. Um, we, want, we want to invite you to answer the first Menti question. It's a bit different today. So which indigenous territory are you participating from today? So like we just said, for those who just came, you can participate using going to menti.com and entering the code 9935763. Wow, lots of locals. Salish, Mi'kmaq, Squimalt, Netherlands. Wow. Anishwabi. Well, that's fantastic. So quite a diversity, no? Hmm. Quite a diversity, yeah, that's fantastic. Great, and I see more answers are Limitees. coming in. Aminakiti, wow. Wonderful. Great. All right, so thank you for entering um, this, uh, these answers. So now, uh, without further ado, I want to go ahead and present our speaker today. So I'm really happy to introduce Peter. Peter is a highly experienced in working with indigenous coastal communities in British Columbia and parts of Canada. He has extensive knowledge of the British Columbia's nations and has visited almost every coastal indigenous community. Peter believes it's a powerful tool when indigenous can run their own observatories and control their own data. Before working with Ocean Networks Canada, Peter worked for 20 years as a documentary television producer for CTV, CBC, APTN. At CTV, um, Peter became the first senior producer for the highly acclaimed award-winning indigenous series, First Story. He was also the Western executive producer for APTN's News and Current Affairs. When Peter is not engaging with indigenous community, he can also be found taking photographs and producing videos for Ocean Networks Canada. To that, I will give you, floor, the, you the floor, Peter. Thank you, Luisa. So uh, welcome everyone. Before we get started, we acknowledge and respect the Songhees, the Squimal, and with Sainish peoples on whose traditional territories the university stands and whose historical relationships to this land continue to this day. Songhees and Esquimalt together are known as Lehuangan, people who make up seven family groups. Lehuangan people means people of the smoked herring, who are the original inhabitants of what is known as Victoria. Wasainish means the emerging people. Tlewilnuk means place of refuge in the Sinchothan language. The mountain saved them from a flood about 10,000 years ago. In English, it is known as Mount Newton today. In the beginning, the creator taught the Wasainish how to take care of the land 
For many years, the Wasanish remembered the wars that had, and had plenty of food from the land and sea. But as years passed, some people broke the Creator's words and forgot its teachings. The Creator became unhappy and told the people there would be a flood over the land and that they should prepare. For several days, the tides began rising higher and higher. It became clear that there was something very dangerous about this tide. Eventually, the people needed their canoes. They tied all their rope together and to themselves. One end of the rope was tied to an arbutus tree on top of the mountain, and when the water stopped rising, the people were left floating in their canoes above the mountain. It was the raven who appeared to tell them that the flood would soon be over. When the, flo when the flood waters were going down, a small child noticed the raven circling in. The child began to jump around and cry out in excitement, look, look what is emerging. Below, when the raven, when the raven had been circling, a piece of land had begun to emerge. The old man pointed down to that place and said, that is our new home, Wasainish. And from now on, we'll be known as the Wasainish people. The old man also declared that that day that the mountain which had offered them protection would be treated with great care and respect. The same respect given to the greatest elders, and it was to be known as Tlewanuk, the place of refuge. Today, the bounty of the land and sea continues to be respected. When engaging with nations, the first step is research who you're asking uh, to collaborate with. This may seem basic, but you'd be surprised of how much this is not done with Indigenous communities. When you go to another country, the first thing you do is research where you're going. The same applies with Indigenous communities. Get to know who, you, who they are, and your words will be spoken with intent. This is how trust is built. Otherwise, your words can come off hollow. Okay, so a little bit about me. My native name is Wa'asamgan, meaning wooden bull, in Niska. I have the pleasure of engaging and building meaningful partnerships with indigenous communities. My nationality is Niska, and uh, as I mentioned, Frisian. Uh, Niska means people of the Nas River. And I'm from the Lachibu clan, or wolf clan, in northern BC. My mother is Niska'a, and my father is Dutch. Dutch from Friesland. On both sides of the family, we come from a long line of fishermen and sailors. My Frisian grandfather was a captain of a ship called My Lady that delivered paper around the world. A commercial fishing vessel was called the Serenade, as you see here on the left. Um, it has orange, it's uh, the Dutch colors, I suppose. In the summer, we uh, trolled for salmon on the west coast of Vancouver Island between Brooks Peninsula and Cape Scott. On the right is my dad, Harard, who I like to call the, the Dutch captain. So thank you for joining me for my presentation this morning. Meaningful Indigenous engagement, building true partnerships in ocean science. What does that mean? Much of my presentation today is derived from Ocean Networks Canada's Ocean Ops 19 report. Indigenous nations have been involved in ocean observation for many generations, both through lived experience and through the use of new and emerging methods. However, the use of Indigenous knowledge in ocean observation is not always well understood or engaged by the non-Indigenous community. In this presentation, you'll be given insight on how some of the priorities, methods, and values for Indigenous ocean observation today and for the coming decade. So today's roadmap, Ocean OBS 19. So you hear about what the first Indigenous delegation uh, recommendations are, the declaration, we'll go over uh, the declaration uh, that was presented to the UN. Uh, we'll also uh, 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 briefly meet Hartley Bay and, and find out about their observatory. And uh, we'll uh, see a little video on Inuit knowledge and uh, Inuit
perspectives and what uh, ocean networks have been doing uh, out on the sea ice. Ocean Arms 19. From September 16th to the 20th in 2019, the Global Ocean Conference, Ocean Arms 19, took place in Honolulu, Hawaii. I mean, look at that view, huh? Um, the meeting occurs every 10 years, bringing people together from all over the world to communicate the progress of ocean observing networks and to chart innovative solutions to society's growing needs for ocean information and governance. For the first time, an indigenous ocean governance forum was created as part of the conference. 53 indigenous delegates from Canada, the United States, the Pacific Islands, and New Zealand attended to build relationships among observers and indigenous communities and to, su and to support and strengthen ocean stewardship and ocean governance. Ocean Networks Canada and the nine member Canadian indigenous delegation led this effort and the coordination of the conference. The indigenous representatives shared their unique knowledge of the oceans, crucial for understanding the changes in the climate, reducing marine hazard risks, enhancing marine spatial planning and food security, monitoring ocean health and marine traffic in traditional ocean territories, and for capacity building. The three primary objectives of the Indigenous delegation were to ensure that Indigenous perspectives were brought forward throughout the conference. These primary objectives of the Indigenous delegation was to ensure that in Indigenous perspectives were brought forward to educate Ocean Ops 19 attendees on the key principles of Indigenous knowledge, as well as to how to respectfully engage with Indigenous communities in, in their respective ways of knowing to learn about ocean observing technologies, ocean observing programs, and sources of ocean information that are relevant to indigenous ocean management and stewardship. The indigenous delegation led and participated in sessions as presenters, panelists, and moderators, all in an effort to enlighten the ocean observing community what meaningful engagement means. Uh, it is what the Mi'kmaq call two-eyed seeing. We often explain two-eyed seeing by saying it refers to learning to see from one eye with the strengths of indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing, and from the other eye with strengths of Western knowledges and ways of knowing, and learning to use both of these eyes together for the benefit of all. So we're going to go to our Menti moment, then you can go ahead and participate using the Menti code 9935763. Now we're asking you, what does meaningful Indigenous engagement mean to you? So for this, you can answer anything that comes to mind. And um, if you want, you can also participate in the Zoom chat. Great, some things Listen are coming to up. to their stories, yes culture appropriate outreach programs. Fantastic, equal partnerships and sharing knowledge and decision making, yes. Co-production of knowledge, absolutely. Very important. Reconciliation, continue, continue, continuous recognition. Listening first, working together second. Full human understanding, indigenous driven understanding needs, transparency, honesty, learning about experience of indigenous peoples, sharing stewardship, responsibilities for the environment, avoiding the repetition of calling as partners, open conversation, not just talks, learning, rec reconciliation, listening, immersive education, respectful, positive engagement, listening voices. Wow, wonderful, wonderful. Those are fantastic, fantastic answers. Thank you, everybody. That's fantastic. Great. So I guess we'll learn a bit more in the next few slides. 
the indigenous delegation had two primary goals to influence how Western science views and understands indigenous ways of knowing, capacity, strengths, and needs with regards to ocean observation in the coming decade. And to advance the direct participation of coastal indigenous peoples in ocean observing relevant to ocean governments in the next 10 years. The Indigenous delegation worked together to collectively attend as many sessions as possible to ensure that an Indigenous voice was heard wherever it would have the most impact, including the Indigenous Ocean Governance Town Hall. We have another Menti. Great. So the same as we just said, you can go to menti.com and enter the code 9935763. So now we want to ask you, how should ocean scientists engage with indigenous communities? So um, if you're not a scientist, it doesn't really matter. We just want to hear your thoughts on that. All right, I think we'll see some answers coming in. You have to yeah, scroll down, perfect. With patience and respect, very good one. Connect with the people, yes. Find out their interests what they want to know, learn, yes. True partnership, partnership. Common interests, absolutely. Beginning, yes, right. Listen to the needs. Boy, these are excellent. Nobody really knows their stuff. Yes, two I'd seen. Listen to understand, yes. Approach with perspective, respect, early and often. Yes, absolutely. Supporting environmental justice. Wow. Oh, these are fantastic. Beautiful answers. Please, I think you guys should lead this workshop. This is fantastic. <laughs> Definitely, we got some really good thoughts coming in. Okay, so I think um, that's it for now. That's great. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, everybody. The goals of the town hall was to begin identifying ocean observing priorities of coastal indigenous peoples over the next decade in relation to themes of Ocean Ops 19. Share successful practices for establishing meaningful partnerships with indigenous communities, organizations, and nations for ocean observing, and highlight priorities for ocean information needs emerging mythologies, and identify gaps in strengthening capacity for Indigenous-led research and participation for, in part, partnerships. Key messages that emerged from the panel were, researchers should think partnerships, not participation, when involving Indigenous communities in their projects. More information must flow into communities from researchers visiting to ensure that indigenous communities benefit from the research being done. Here we also talked about that uh, these delegates are very tired that that's the knowledge is uh, very often taken uh, without with very little consultation and then and there's no they're very they're, they're not credited properly in scientific papers. Uh, apparently this has been a trend and uh, um, hopefully that is getting better. Knowledge, knowledge exchange is bi-directional. Indigenous knowledge is deep, specific, comprehensive, and often addresses critical needs for food security and survival. We heard questions such as, uh, if I came on a boat, uh, house in the Arctic, how am I supposed to engage the Indigenous on shore? Well, plan ahead, right? Um, also heard other questions about, you know, I've, I've, uh, I have some friends who don't really, uh, one person was being honest, care so much with engaging with indigenous, or they just, they don't understand. How do I, how do I inform them better? And they said, oh, they, they like longer term data, right? And so the delegation went over, understand the protocols, follow the protocols. The indigenous community has to be informed properly. A scientist needs approval. True partnerships start on an equal playing field. True partnerships start with budget, pre-planning, 
after developing that relationship, start to discuss the proposals and the projects of the work. There has to be a shared benefit, shared knowledge, sharing of resources. There has to be a way to develop cooperative work plans. When people are doing things together, they actually can benefit fully from what's going on there. Seems like common sense, right? Key takeaways from the conference included a need to increase communication across Indigenous nations. Building capacity for communities to engage in ocean monitoring and ocean data collection. And maintaining control over how Indigenous data is used and managed. It's a very important one. And the nations here on the coast have been getting really strong and very adamant of how data is managed and how it's controlled. We have uh, uh, the Tsleil-Waututh own their own observatory, and I'll be getting into telling a little bit about Kitkat's observatory, which just got deployed. Okay, so um, another Menti moment, the same thing, go to menti.com and use the code 9935763. So now we want to ask you on the range of what are the benefits for scientists to collaborate with indigenous knowledge holders? So um, make sure to focus on the words benefits for scientists for this question. If it comes to, um, if you have personal experience, please go ahead. Or if you have any thoughts, enter them. Term observations, the past, yes. Very important with long term um, observations, better questions, better answers, better science, holistic understanding, going to deeper understanding, multiple ways of knowing, yes, new perspectives, sheer knowledge, yes, more holistic understandings of the process. Broader sources of funding, rich you know, data, explain Western quantum data longer-term understanding. Old eyes. <laughs> Informing, Informing the new eyes. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Great. Love that. Great. More relevance, yes, to the public. Feel, uh, fill, in the, uh, yeah, fill in the gaps. Place-based knowledge. Better relationship with the nations. Perspectives, perspectives, broader understanding. It's fantastic, everybody. These are just great. Great you answers. You guys really know your stuff. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, those were some of the benefits for scientists. So now yeah, we'll share you uh, share with you the Ocean OBS uh, 19 video. <laughs> Ha <laughs> Indigenous communities have been managing their ecosystems and their territories since time immemorial, and observations of their ecosystems is what provided an opportunity to practice good stewardship and sustainable stewardship of those, of those resources. The Western science is taking a large proportion of the information that comes out, and this is what the nation states use to make their decisions. And we're not just bear monitors, and we're not just guides. We are the original Arctic scientists. So we have to try to elevate um, indigenous knowledge to sort of balance that field so that we can have the best possible information, the best possible science, so that when it does come time for our political leaders to make informed decisions, that they we're putting the good information in front of them.
We're all here because we want more meaningful engagement to have such a wide range of Indigenous peoples come together and work together is amazing. It was a little overwhelming at first, trying to figure out how we would place our message and our voice throughout this conference. With 1,500 participants, it was a little daunting. And I think very strongly that because of the ceremonies we had right at the beginning, that the term Indigenous uh, perspectives, Indigenous participation, Indigenous knowledge are starting to creep into a number of the discussions. So we have a declaration that we are going to present and we want to do this as Indigenous Nations to a representative of the United Nations in front of the entire uh, delegation that showed up here at Ocean Ops to witness what we're trying to do. In the declaration, we call for the recognition of our Indigenous Nations. We call for the contribution that our Indigenous Nations can make. We call for people to recognize the, the intimate connection we have with nature. Moving forward, this document can provide a general, unified expression and understanding for researchers to approach Indigenous communities with good spirit and in a good way. You know, it is very important for these this thousands of people to understand the wisdom that comes to them with their declarations. And this brings to us, you know, the centuries of wisdom. It brings to us uh, the understanding why we are doing this. So uh, that was a declaration that actually gave us an additional spiritual support for what we do. So we will make it known and we will use it. I'm glad to be here. It's almost like it's almost like a groundbreaking experience for for our indigenous people to be you know to be engaging at this level and it's worldwide and I think that's that's a long time coming. But to be able to stand with a group of people and be united um, in the importance of bringing an indigenous voice to a scientific community, it was a really great honor. It's setting a bar for future events like this one and Ocean Knobs 29. Thank you, everybody. So the declaration. Um, so a coastal indigenous uh, a coastal indigenous people's declaration, Aha Hanua, was developed during the West the week of Ocean Ops 19 and presented on the last day of the conference. Hanua means world or earth in Hawaiian. In that declaration, it said. We, the indigenous delegates at Ushinaabs 19, present this declaration known as the Aha Ahanua to our fellow members of the global ocean observing community. Indigenous people continue to perpetuate our cultures and governance systems as we have done for generations. Our ancestral, cultural, and spiritual connections to the natural resources maintain our inherent governance systems as well as to establish the foundation for our principles of sustainability. Our existence comes from all life, and therefore, we as the first stewards have the responsibility to our oceans and shoreline ecosystems. We call on the ocean observing community to formally recognize the traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples worldwide, as well as the, as the articles within the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We'll work with the ocean observing community to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the goals of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. In the third paragraph, it says, we call on the ocean observing community to establish the meaningful partnerships with the indigenous communities, organizations, and nations to learn and respect each other's ways of knowing, design, develop, and carry out ocean observing initiatives, share responsibilities and resources. 
This work, which began as a delegation, has strengthened ties across Canada, the United States, the Pacific Islands, and New Zealand. And these groups are now working together and independently on a number of initiatives, including addressing the, the Mauna Kea issue, developing a large-scale research project, forming connections with the United Nations, and proposing a theme for the UN Decade of Ocean Science and Sustainable Development, as we mentioned earlier. In this picture is the Paior. I, I hope I'm still learning, I'm still learning about the Hawaiian names. But the Paior is a Hawaiian gift given to the Canadian delegates to symbolize how strong the 53 member delegation is when bonded. Each strand is a person. So can you imagine if we added more strands to that and created more of a bond, how strong we are? Uh, the West Coast uh, First Nation gifted a paddle to the Hawaiians. And the paddle represents uh, when we paddle together, we are faster and stronger. Hartley Bay Observatory. Reconciliation with Indigenous people of Canada, including First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples, is a high current priority. With the longest coastline in the world, Canada has a lot of observers. As you can see from this, this map of Ocean Networks Canada, uh, Ocean Networks Canada has partnered with numerous Indigenous communities to understand our oceans. One of these communities, Hartley Bay, on the central coast of, of BC. And that, if you just, just down there, that's where Hartley Bay is. Means for addressing reconciliation is by improving critical services to Indigenous communities, addressing past harms committed, as well as increasing engagement and transparency in how research, policy, decision-making takes place in Canada. Carving a path in ocean engagement starts on the right foot. As an Indigenous community liaison for Ocean Networks Canada, I have the great pleasure of asking nations, how can I support you in ocean science? In what capacity? How can we work together? Um, plus, I get to see some good friends in some of these communities, which is always a bonus. Excuse me. In Indigenous people from communities, regional bodies, and governments to national institutions and organizations are actively engaged in their own acts of resurgence, resurgence and self-determination. Increasingly, Indigenous organizations are articulating their own priorities and are implementing change in their, on their own terms, such as the GitGat, who are informing ONC of where the best location would be for their observatory. Key changes include Indigenous people under, undertaking their own research projects, including design, imp implementation, analysis, and dissemination, and using the data from research to help answer critical questions affecting their territories and or their interests. It's also good to know that Indigenous partnerships ensures longer-term data as well as protecting sacred sites. At Ocean Networks Canada, we have partnered, as I mentioned, with the GitGat in Hartley Bay, BC, to deploy an ocean observatory in the Douglas Channel around 150 meters. Their main objective is to track shipping, its impacts, and to monitor their whale's health. The observatory has a number of sensors. It's got a video camera on it, uh, uh, which is recorded and streamed live to the internet. This can be used to monitor sea life and examine sea, sea bottom and, and monitor turbi turbidity or cloudiness. Um, also we mentioned that our, our, all our observatories are, are cabled, so you can access this all 24 seven, 365 days a year. They also have a cool microphone called a hydrophone uh, that records underwater sound and that's live streamed to the internet, can, can be used to study marine mammals, monitor vessels, and detect earthquakes and landslides, and has water property measurements used to monitor basic ocean conditions, measure temperature, salinity, oxygen, chlorophyll, and turbidity. Just to name a few of the sensors, these uh, really sophisticated uh, put on by Marine Technology uh, Center. 
So within five years, the GitGap Nation will be a top provider in ocean data. And that data is just starting to flow now, as I mentioned earlier, that we have deployed an observatory now in your territory, uh, which was done through funding they received and ONC helped match uh, those funds. Uh, ONC uh, uh, worked with them very closely um, uh, and we will continue to help maintain the observatory for many years to come. Inuit knowledge. This shift towards increasing Indigenous control over research and data management paired with an understanding at the highest political level that reconciliation means having a seat at the decision making table is creating fundamental shifts in a status quo approach to engaging with Indigenous peoples. The Canadian Indigenous delegation Ocean Ops 19 reflected the recognition and acknowledgement and support this trend. The Arctic sea ice is melting at a rate faster than almost all climate models predicted. Ocean Networks Canada collaborates with coastal communities to monitor our changing ocean. In Cambridge Bay, Nunavut, studying sea ice processes is a key aspect of understanding climate change and its impacts in the Arctic. These jovial elders shared their traditional ecological knowledge and spoke about how the ice has become unpredictable and having lost family through the ice. They're finding it more difficult to hunt for certain foods during the seasons. They also speak of, of late freeze-ups, killing caribou, and how, how the third week of September, the bay doesn't freeze anymore. 10 years ago, they said you would be able to skidoo on the ocean. Now you can't, it's so unpredictable. And this makes it very difficult for, for hunting. Uh, now we'll play the, the monitoring sea ice video. Ocean Networks Canada has been monitoring the conditions in the bay since 2012. I noticed a very big change. We're getting very warm, hot temperatures earlier, and the ice is different every year. There's a record of ice thickness here going back 50 years. And what we see is there is a, a decreasing trend in the ice thickness. It seems to be forming later and later every year. Yeah, it affects all of us here for traveling, for hunting. The dates of freeze up are getting later in the year and the dates of break up are getting earlier. When we have scientists come up, at least they let us know how thick the ice is and what's happening to the climate. Our job with our department is specifically to make sure that the work that we're doing at Ocean Networks Canada is relevant to communities and meets priorities in community. And then finding ways that we can work together that uh, help all of us understand these changing conditions better. All right, so uh, let, let a few moments <laughs> for all this good information to sync up. And um, let's go to the Menti question. So go to menti.com and use the code 9935763. So this question is a bit similar to the past one, but a bit reverse. So what are the benefits for indigenous to collaborate with scientists? So here, um, watch for the word benefits. So what are the benefits for indigenous? So we flipped this one from the last one. So this is the benefits for indigenous. It's a bit harder to answer. <laughs> okay, so we have some answers coming up. Do you want to read them, Peter? Sure. Education, documenting changes, environmental protection, resources that indigenous communities may not have, example, capacity, financial, access to infrastructure and technology, yes. Ensure their knowledge is given an equal place at the table. Combine knowledge of science and, and uh, IK, that's right. Access to technology, so yeah, yeah. Um, get the feeling that they're heard, feeling wel welcomed into science rather than walked over. Yeah. Access to funding to support community projects and services. Expose indigenous culture to scientific method, participation, understand they have tools, multiple, uh, mitigate the effects um, 
scientific prediction. Access to powerful technologies and methods. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This is a, this is a great. Improved access to research. Wow. Thank you, everybody. That's fantastic. Okay. So thank you for those answers and back to you. World Coastal Indigenous. The 2016 United Nations data estimates that there's 370 to 500 million indigenous. It's 5% of the world's population. 27 million indigenous live on the coast in nearly 2,000 communities in 87 countries. It's, it's estimated that the total global yearly seafood consumption is of about 2.1 million. And the heart of indigenous culture is seafood. And in West Coast culture, salmon is the top of that list. Indigenous are beginning to utilize the underwater technology as we've seen to protect their resource and better understand what is happening to our oceans. And Ocean Ops, they, they, they put together the Living Action Plan. The Living Action Plan is to formalize the Coastal Indigenous Forum, work with international observing programs, compile information on current practices in conducting ocean observing with Indigenous partners. So you guys answered all these things correctly. It's fantastic. So to fully understand our ocean past and present, we have to work together to protect the future for the next generations. The indigenous delegation attendance at Ocean, Ob Ocean Ops 19 initiated, initiated positive momentum towards strengthening the stewardship and ocean co-management in Canada and in around the world. The attendees remain very interested in continuing the work and further developing international relationships. Indigenous partners participation needs to be at the forefront of important international initiatives such as the Commonwealth Blue Charter and the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. ONC is committed to pursuing ongoing funding support to further coordinate efforts that enhance this mission. Thank you everybody for joining my presentation today. There's a lot to unpack and there's a lot more to do. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for this wonderful presentation. Um, I think we've learned many, many different things and it has broadened our perspective. So thank you um, all for participating too. It was uh, very nice to see so many good answers and uh, thoughts. Um, so we will still have four more upcoming webinars on November 4th, November 18th, and in December. So make sure that uh, you watch your emails to attend to those. You can also connect with Ocean Networks Canada with our different platforms. You can go into our website, you can use our Ocean Data Portal, Oceans 2.0, or you can also go into our social media channels. Uh, we have some good content that comes up every week. So our YouTube channel, Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And finally, if you have any specific questions, you can also email us um, at that address. We would like uh, to also give a thank you to all of our different funders. Ocean Networks Canada is funded by the Canada Foundation for Innovations, the Government of Canada, Natural Resources Canada, Fisheries, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Canary, the Government of British Columbia, the University of Victoria, and many, many more. All right. So um, now we'll be doing the Q&A. So any questions that you have, we would love to answer. You can use, we were going to use Mentimeter like we did. So go to menti.com and enter the code 9935763. Will the presentation be shared? I can answer that. Yes, <laughs> it will be shared. Um, like all of our different webinars, they're all recorded and posted on YouTube. You should receive an email in a few days um, with all of that information. We'll also be sharing all the links that were in the presentation. Okay, so now we have a few answers that um, have come up. Uh, sorry, questions. Um, is there any concern that indigenous communities are getting homogenized, being treated as all the same because of how science thinks about the word indigenous? Mm. Quite a big question. <laughs> it's a tough one. Uh, it's a tough one to unpack. Um, uh, uh, 
I think it goes back to two two eyed seeing and uh, threading carefully and uh, with all the Western eye Westernization influence. Um, I think indigenous have such a strong foundation in in their culture and in their systems and principles that uh, um, uh, they will always hold a certain ground of keeping certain things separated. I'm not sure if that entirely answers your question on that, um, um, but uh, certainly there's a fine li line to thread between the two. And yes, as indigenous get more into technology and uh, you know, there's certain federal funding and stuff, they, they do have to be careful of, uh, of, uh, of, of how they thread in, in those waters. But uh, lots of great opportunities there. Yes, um, I guess it's also a different opinion, right? Um, what is the most uh, respectful way to engage with indigenous communities? Maybe uh, you can quickly kind of summarize what you uh, talked. Do your research. <laughs> Do your research, listen. Um, uh, before you even start talking about business, you know, indigenous want to know you. They want to get to know you. you. Can't fly in and show a PowerPoint, fly out without really getting to know you. The PowerPoint people, you know, there's only so much that they will listen to. That they need to get to know you first. Uh, one of the delegates told me, um, he said, it "Can be as simple." He says, "Bring a gift," but that gift can be as simple as, "Tell me a story. Tell me a story, and tell me about yourself. Let's talk business the next day." And that can go a long way, as opposed to bulldozing your way in or digging around a territory without informing properly. Um, if you inform properly, you'll find out you'll get support. Uh, you'll be get told about certain areas and, um, and uh, they'll help guide you to what your, what your research is. So do your research, do your homework first, and also, as we mentioned, you know, start with the pre-planning of the budget. You got a budget, you know you're going to a traditional territory, you know you, at some point uh, um, you, you want to consult with indigenous, start all this stuff early. Don't let this be an afterthought. Thank you, that's a very good, um, good talk. Um, so now on the Ocean Hop 19, um, most of the indigenous people participating were uh, or seem to be from the Pacific. How about people from other, other ocean regions? Absolutely. I mean, we've got a lot more work to do around the world. And uh, um, I really would love to hear all about the other, the other ocean regions. Um, excuse me. This was particularly, this, this delegation was particularly based around the Pacific Ocean obviously, and I would love to hear from their delegations. I'm sure they had other delegations going on with the same issues, you know, and I really look forward to having a World Indigenous Ocean Forum um, at some point and where we can, we can talk out all these uh, challenges we face around the world, especially with climate change. We all have very similar stories. And as I mentioned that, you know, our seafood is, is under threat, so, um, yes, to be, it's good to bring more out there. And this was just one conference and there's going to be many, uh, indigenous are slowly now being invited to the table. And so I really hope to see more of those world indigenous. Yes. And also from other parts of the Pacific, because, uh, myself being in Colombia, South America oh, yes. didn't have a participation, right? So absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, sometimes these things happen quick and funding and, you know, yes. I, I wish, I wish we could have had all that participation. And I think we, it was just a, it was how things were selected. And, and, and uh, uh, we also put a steering committee to together that uh, chose the delegation. I should mention that. And that steering committee chose the Canadian delegation. And then we had uh, coordinators from Hawaii who chose the Pacific uh, delegations. And then we came together. So, but yes, absolutely, we need we need more. We need to strengthen yes. <laughs> that uh, that payor. 
<laughs> yes, we need to make it longer, but it's still, it was a beautiful event and conference. Um, okay. What space is there for partnerships between indigenous peoples, scientists, and lawyers? What space? So maybe um, a space for dialogues. Is there anything that exists as such that would combine these different uh, groups together? No, I, I don't know. Those are good suggestions. I'm not, uh, I don't, I'm not aware of any at the moment. Um, but I'd be happy to, I'll, I'll like no, take note of this and uh, that's a good question to look into. You know, perhaps it needs to be created still. Yes, or also um, it can be on the issues, so for example, governance issues. So that's a field that combines um, these three groups. Right, yes. Um, great, um, so we have a more personal question. Are you still meeting with indigenous communities that you haven't met with yet? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, well, currently, we, we're, I'll just bring that in the current scope, uh, working on um, uh, a tsunami project. We're doing a risk assessment on the west coast of Vancouver Island, and there's some communities that I haven't met. Uh, I've been to the communities. That's, I mean, I've, I know everybody in every community or the whole, the, you know, the, the whole councils or anything. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, we're going to be working with uh, a lot of the indigenous, um, collecting a lot of uh, the uh, traditional knowledge of tsunamis from uh, 1700 and in 1964 one, and uh, you know, with the 1700 uh, tsunami, uh, I'm not sure how much you're aware, but you know, indigenous have said yes, there was a tsunami here, you know, in 1700, and we have it in our legends and our myths. And there's a number of different legends and myths. There's the the battle between the whale and and Thunderbird and uh, uh, Thunderbird dropped the whale in the ocean. There's uh, earthquake foot. Uh, you can look at some of these up at Shake Up at the Museum of Anthropology on their website. They have some of these stories. Um, and uh, um, so I'll be, I'm looking forward to collecting more of that information. I've already been meeting new, new elders uh, I've never met and been collecting all that knowledge and finding out about tsunamis that were from 3000 years ago that uh, wiped out communities around lakes on the West Coast. And, this wave actually went right over the, these mountains, like just insane that uh, how large tsunamis were in the past. But uh, that's another story. But yes, <laughs> engaging all the time. And as an engagement person, I'm always learning and I'm always absorbing. And when I did those, the, the, the little mini doc there in Ocean Ops, you know, I've learned so much from from other indigenous around the world and their perspectives. Do you never stop learning in this, uh, this job? This is why I love it. They're always absorbing information and, and finding ways to communicate that information. Great. So um, maybe to continue on that question, what's uh, one thing you're excited about that's coming up next for ONC and indigenous engagement? Well, there's a tsunami one, as, as I uh, mentioned. I'm, I'm also very excited about the engagement that we have going on with the GitGa now that they're going to be having data coming through for the first time. It's been five years in the making. So we're really excited about that. I'm also working with the Canadian Ocean Observing uh, Systems uh, uh, for a new uh, data portal for uh, we're bringing on indigenous to that, which is part of the global ocean observing systems. And uh, so that's one other project that we're work currently working on right now. And excuse me, we also have lots of K to 12 initiatives as well. We're working on lesson plans with the Kitas Kitasuhehe of uh, Clem2 and uh, a number of other uh, 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 lesson plans that, uh, with, uh, that incorporates indigenous knowledge. Uh, based on on their territories, um, so yeah, lots going on, and yeah. uh, we're we're always uh, you know every day we're always engaging more, and and uh, um, uh, this is this is the best part of my job is is in, is getting to chat with all the cool peeps out there. Wow, I want that job. Seems exciting. <laughs> So um, just to go back a bit to uh, Habzantin, we have a question from Clarissa in the Zoom. Not all communities were able to attend, like you said. Is there a way for those communities to still participate? So now. 
Yes, I think as we, as the delegation organizes itself for the next 10 years, they want to hear from those communities. And uh, um, ideas can be sent to uh, ONC um, and we will, we will bring those forth to the delegation and, uh, um, and also speak, of course, that's the Canadian delegation and we'll also speak with the, the other delegations from, from the other Pacific Islands. And uh, um, certainly, yeah, more is better. We, we don't have a full plan yet. The, you know, Ocean Ops has taken its life of its own and, and that momentum keeps moving forward. And um, we definitely, you know, are looking at the next Ocean Ops in 10 years. Uh, um, and, and, uh, and so we are going to need more people for that, for sure. Great, great. So more exciting things coming up. All right, so we still have one minute. Let's go maybe and answer the last question quickly. So maybe something a bit to finish on a more personal note. Um, question for Peter. Has I'm Dutch, um, do you also eat uh, herring fresh, fresh, holding it by tell as Dutch people traditionally do? <laughs> <laughs> I've got pictures of myself doing that in uh, in Holland, actually. <laughs> um, yes, and uh, I, I do. I have some in the freezer that I haven't cooked yet. And also, uh, uh, I enjoy them smoked, um, uh, as Niska do. We, we smoke it, and it's, uh, it's one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, so I want to thank all of the participants for those great questions. Um, Peter, thank you once again for these great talks and answers. And um, hopefully you've taken a lot of things with you. So please um, just take two minutes to uh, complete our satisfaction survey. Um, Kaylin will post it in the chat uh, right now. And uh, we look forward to having you in the next four webinars. So watch out your emails for that. Thank you so Thank much, you everybody. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Bye, everybody.